are moderated with Bob Bowden here. So without any further ado, I'll turn it over to him. They're going to discuss accelerating the paradigm shift in education. That's right. Don't forget the break on through to the other side for those Doors fans who might be, uh, well, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, so thanks for coming. Again, my name is Bob Bowden. I work for Choice Media. We publish a daily newswire about education reform. Today we're talking with a whole wide group of people about uh, different ways to accelerate the paradigm shift, as we say, to the future of what might be coming next in education. I wanted to start with a little bit of a video. This is a video shot from this year, and this, is, this lets you know what the teachers' unions do in certain cities. In this case, it's from Philadelphia. It was from October of last year. And this is an example of what happened when the uh, school commission, SRC it's called, School Reform Commission, uh, wanted to uh, start hearing new applications for charter schools for the first time in seven years. This is what the union did at the meeting. Completely shutting down the meeting, screaming, chanting. All paid to be there by the union. We don't have to watch all of it, but you guys get the idea. This is what happens, and and, and if you think this is a, some sort of you know rare exception, I just want to give you news from literally yesterday. Looks like the talks in Chicago are breaking down and they're aiming for another teacher strike. They had one in 2012 and contract halts, they now say, run, run to a halt. Uh, in 2012, the difference was Barack Obama was running for re-election and Rahm Emanuel, the mayor of Chicago, had been formerly Barack Obama's right-hand man as the chief of staff for Barack Obama before becoming mayor of Chicago. Widely rumored that he got a phone call from Pennsylvania Avenue uh, in uh, October of 2012, right before the election, and said, shut this strike down, make a deal, basically gave the union 19% raise. Widely rumored this time he won't be so uh, amenable, and it could be a much longer uh, strike. So this is the kind of thing that goes on. I just wanted to kind of start you guys off with some of the realities of what's happening in the world of education, and, and we wanted to now invite some of our uh, esteemed panelists to tell you their perspectives of different uh, things going on in the education space. I want to start with I want to start with uh, Maya Yakov, who's going to come and talk and give her perspective. So please welcome Maya. Hi. Uh, so I'm 14 years old, and I've gone to many different schools. And I've been so I went to a Waldorf school, which is sorry. Okay. So I went to a Waldorf school, which is a nature-based education. When I was younger. I've been homeschooled, unschooled, I've gone unschooled, I've gone to um, public school and private school, and now I go to a charter school. <laughs> so basically, I'm here to give you my two cents on all the different experiences that I've had. Um, so I, I wanted to say that I've actually learned from all of the different schools that I've gone to. They've all helped me in some way. <laughs> So um, in Waldorf school, it was kind of very holistic. I learned how uh, many different talents, and I've had a lot of different experiences. Homeschooling, I also had the opportunity to learn so many things that I would have never learned. I've got to go horseback riding, learn martial arts, uh, talk to more adults, so many different things like that. Um, from public school, I got lice, head lice. It was great. And, um, from my liberal arts education from the private school that I went to, I learned a lot work ethic and really how to write amazing papers. <laughs> and now I go to a STEM-based charter school and I've come, learned to overcome a lot of challenges because that one was very hard for me at the beginning of the year. We have over three hours of homework every night. So <laughs> there's a lot of stuff to do. So. Um, Yes, that's, that's what I wanted to uh, say. One thing, can you explain to them what a Waldorf school is? Yeah, so a uh, Waldorf school is really a nature-based education. It's all about completing your holistic path before you can even start learning. We learn how to knit before we learn how to write because they thought that that would help us improve our brain capacity, really. Um, so I, I learned how to read when I was nine. So... Um, 
basically there's a lot of dancing and singing and nature activities and different stuff like that. Okay, great. And uh, ironic that you did not get the head lice at the school with the nature activities. That's uh, yeah. so. At any rate, uh, let, let's turn down to Jody, who, uh, Jody Underwood, who knows a lot about both education in New Hampshire and also the fight to change the culture nationally. So please welcome Jody. So I think most of my adult life has been spent doing something related to education. I have a PhD in education where I focused on how people learn. I'm really interested in that aspect. And I, I never thought I would do much in public schools, but I did. Um, I spent a few years just sort of observing the, what do they call it? Um, I, I was doing research in classrooms. So like with a PhD, that's what you do. You don't do anything real, right? You just do research. Um, and I design software for learning and assessment, and I still do, and I love doing that. And I teach dance, for example. I mean, I'm into learning and teaching and just helping individuals learn. Um, I'm also on the Corden School Board. I've been on the school board for four years, and I, four and a half years, and I've actually been chair for four of those years. Um, and we had an interesting experience this year where we started school choice, and we um, added public, sorry, private schools to the list of choices that parents could make for their children, and the state isn't very happy with that. Um, and, but we actually feel, and we have strong backing to say that we're, we're within the law. There's no, uh, if you want to interpret made to mean must, then we're against the law, but you know, we don't. Um, so, I mean, that, that's my background. I know, you know, and, <clears throat> I know a bit about what's going on in New Hampshire education, but I know more about Croydon. Um, one of the things I've been playing with for the last couple of years is um, how do we get out of the entrenched assumptions that we have about public education? And that's one of my challenges on the school board, right? I want to try to break out of the mold. So, all right, so Croydon has a, uh, it's a one-room schoolhouse, but it, it doesn't, it, and it's the one of the two longest um, running uh, one-room schoolhouses in, in the state and possibly even the country. Um, but right now it's um, not quite one-room schoolhouse, it's, but it is multi-age classrooms. We have kindergarten by itself, one and two, and three and four, and that's all we have. School choices for five through 12. Um, so that's all good, but so what are the entrenched assumptions? One, like, all right, why not private schools, right? That's where we started. But you know, then there's why do you group kids by age? Right? My, my husband likes to call this the, the horoscope uh, effect, right? Just depending on when you were born, that's where you get put. Uh, compulsory attendance, what's that about? You know, it's probably a little old to have compulsory attendance. How about governments producing and controlling schools? Providing education doesn't necessarily mean to produce it, just as with other things like healthcare, or, although they're going there too now, right? Um, and finally, are taxes needed to to provide an adequate education. So these are some of the things I'm trying to challenge and bring into our small town of Croydon and hopefully other people will follow suit. Thank you very much. Uh, moving on to Michelle Level, who uh, I guess is behind the Twitter handle NH Ed Choice. So I think that demonstrates her New Hampshire uh, credentials uh, to some degree, but please welcome Michelle, everybody. Thank you. Um, my name is Michelle Lavalle and I work with School Choice NH.org. I also am a volunteer for Network for Educational Opportunities, which is the tax credit scholarship program here in the state. Um, one of the things that I do most is I dog the state house uh, on all their education bills. This last year we had 80 of them. And let me tell you, the overwhelming majority were anti-choice, trying to shut down the sorts of options that Jody and others in the state are trying to promote. So uh, what I wanted to speak to were these sorts of pressures that I see happening in New Hampshire and around the country. So we've got forces for good. So educational choices like homeschooling, which has um, doubled from 1999 to 2012. We've got the growth of charter schools. Um, we've got roughly 5% of all students are now enrolled in charter schools around the country. That's roughly 2.3 million students. Uh, we also have, um, let's see, we've got, of course, online education. They, they refer to it as unbridled growth. That's awesome, I love that. That's roughly three point, they say um, that's up 3.7% just from the previous year. 
they estimate that 5.3 million students of all age brackets have taken at least one online class as of 2013. So this sort of exponential growth is fueling the fires. We've got tax credit scholarship programs. We've got uh, educational savings accounts. And all of these things are putting pressure on these sorts of unions that are in that video we saw. And these forces are kind of hitting loggerheads. Fortunately, these um, free market types of opportunities are growing and growing, and I think those are going to continue. We're seeing that national trend. But the forces for bad, such as uh, government, the lobbyists, like the teacher unions, like administration units. I don't know if folks know this, but there are uh, school board administration unions, there are uh, school board associations, and all these groups work against our choices. Uh, so it's much more subtle, and frankly, they use taxpayer dollars to do it. So hold your representatives accountable. Uh, it essentially creates like a Harrison Bergeron society where they're lowering the bar and you know putting more and more restrictions on where people can achieve. So that's this top-down education reform from the feds down to the state and shoving that on the schools. Uh, Common Core, they also call that uh, college and career readiness standards. All of that is intended to dumb down the education system and, and what kids actually have an opportunity to learn. The standardized assessments. You don't have to s require curriculum in order to dictate what happens in those classrooms. Those tests dictate what happens, and that's state nationwide, frankly. Uh, and this one-size-fits-all is becoming more and more entrenched. So anything we can do to break out of that one-size-fits-all mold is part of helping. And that's what I, I would like to encourage all of us here to do, is to break out of that restricted mindset. So whether or not you have kids of school age or not, there are things you can do to encourage kids to take charge of their education, so find their passion, whether it's math, reading, robotics, uh, dance, whatever empower them with the with the responsibility of enjoying it finding the things that ignite them and frankly those are the things that are going to make people aware that they can they don't have to rely on government for the education of their children and then once they get that in their head that they can do it it opens up all kinds of possibilities whether it's to see, you know, hey, those charter schools, they're doing something right. I don't have to rely on the public schools to educate my kids. Or even more radical yet, try homeschooling. I mean, that's the ultimate in a self-directed education. So uh, I would encourage people just to start with those baby steps of finding that nugget of what ignites those children that are in, so important in your life. Uh, and then, um, you know, those, those are the things, and these are trends nationally. It's not just in New Hampshire, but it's all good. All right. I mentioned yesterday the U.S. in the most recent PISA international test uh, tied for 30th in the world. By any measure among... Woo! Yeah, yeah. <laughs> enthusiastic fan of we're number 30. We need a, a sign with lots of fingers, don't we? A foam sign. Uh, so we, of course, trailed behind countries in for 15-year-old math comparisons around the world, countries like Japan and Singapore and Canada and, uh, and the usual suspects, Shanghai province of China, Hong Kong, etc. We also trailed behind countries like Estonia, like Latvia, and like Poland. So it's clear that uh, we are, a lot of countries are doing better than we are, and so it represents some of the uh, international perspective on what some other places are doing better than we are. We have Camille Sabulski who's joined us, and please welcome Camille. Hi, everybody. Yes, I am Camille. I'm uh, from Poland, and I have university there, private university. I established it seven or eight years ago. And we're growing now. We have university in Thailand, in Bangkok, and in Zambia, in Lusaka, and UK, in London, yeah? Uh, so, uh, I know something about education around the world, and I know one thing, public education sucks. <laughs> Believe me. I'm mostly in, you know, university business, but uh, in 
uh, in Zambia, we establish uh, first uh, preschool and uh, second uh, primary school and secondary school. And what, what my experience is fr from this experiment that the, we must change goals of our education because now people thinking that the main goal is to get knowledge from the school, not. Now, knowledge is nothing. Now, maybe knowledge have value 100 years ago because we don't have internet yet. But now knowledge is everywhere, in, even in Zambia. Imagine, we built this school in a very poor compound called Linda, very near Lusaka, which is capital of uh, Zambia. Very, very poor compound. And uh, our priest, very nice guy, Jacek Gniadek, you know, the most freedom-oriented priest you can ever know. He always, when uh, he goes somewhere, he, took, he take two books, Bible and Human Action. Yeah, so. And he organized a meeting with, uh, with me and some people uh, from Poland who, who came with me to Zambia with children from Paris. And imagine, after speech, there was maybe 80 person. I had 20 invitation on Facebook from them because they have smartphone. Why? Because Facebook do wonderful things there. You have smartphone. I think even without SIM card, you don't buy anything, but you have access to Facebook for free. Yeah? So children have knowledge because they have internet. They don't have power in their houses, but they go to the mass and they charge their phone. Yeah? It's work perfectly. But what should we put as the goal the culture the main goal is to change the culture of young human yeah uh, i saw this when i go there i, I was a volunteer who works uh, we build the, the, the school and we mm, we we ask some locals to help us uh, with this building and they have maybe two or three hours late. They've been two hours late. And we ask them, why are you are late? Two hours, come on, I'm waiting for you two hours. And he said, you people from Europe have a watches, but we have a time. And I said, and nothing more. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> tough. And this is, the, this is the main goal. We must change the culture because it really exists, culture of being poor and the culture of being maybe not rich but, but wealthy. Yes, so uh, if we change this culture, we, we can do everything. And this is the reason why we are so successful in, in Poland and, and around the world because uh, I have you no know, business school. We teach about business. We are our customers uh, are uh, business owner, yeah? and uh, we don't teach. We only try to connect them with another uh, businesses, uh, self-made men, millionaires, multimillionaires, even billionaires, and ask th those you know uh, successful guy to speak something and. After the speeches, we go together, drink some beer. Because beer is good, yeah? I'm, I'm from Poland, so I, I know something about this. And this is it. We employ as a lecturer only entrepreneurs and about this union. We don't pay. 600 person work for us without any payment. Why? You know, you know this uh, pyramids well, of needs? Well, for the Chicago negotiations when, they, <laughs> when they're coming up and for the teachers' union contract. You, you know this uh, muscle of pyramids of needs? Yeah. Yeah. The, the first step is to have uh, food, yeah, have where sleep, and uh, sleep with someone. Yeah? 
Second is the security. So this is the inside uh, sure that I will always have some to eat, etc. But the third is the uh, people wanted to be part of society. They want to be the elders. They want to share with their knowledge. So we have natural uh, system that when somebody are successful, he will share with this with his knowledge. So if we just build the place with the, where the natural changing of uh, mind of our experience will happen, so we will have great educational system. All Thank right, you. Let, yeah, sure. Thank you. Let's get a little back and forth. And so I wanted to ask uh, Jody, when you hear um, uh, Camille say uh, s public school sucks, and I'm looking at a person who got a PhD in education and then is on a school board, a public school board, what is your intuitive, and yet you were nodding through a lot of what he said. <laughs> What's your intuitive reaction to that? How do you well, viscerally respond? Well, duh. <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know what, I think some kids perform well in public schools for whatever reasons, and, right. and some kids don't. There's no one-size-fits-all solution. I mean, but what, I mean there's, there's so many things wrong with public schools that make them suck, and one is that it's this uh, monopoly, right? With no competition, no accountability, right. no anything. So it's not going to work. Now, just to right? stand there for a second, a lot of the establishment defenders and apologists will say to you, oh, we, we need more cooperation, not competition. We need to get together and all work for the children, not this drive everything to the lowest common denominator with this scorched earth competition thing that these Jody people want. Grr. Right. You know what? I have an experience. <laughs> I, when I went to high school, I went to what was called an experimental high school, and it was pass-fail because they didn't think competition was the right thing to do. So I was, I mean, so pass-fail, you had to pass a class. And you know, pass, I didn't have to do anything. I did not learn how to study in high school. I learned how to party and hang out with people. That's what, and that's all I was interested in, right? Um, it, it, so that, that was a failure for me. Now many people did do well there, right? They had a good arts program, and that just wasn't what I was interested in. Sure. And the first time I actually took school seriously was when my parents were paying for it when I went to college. I was like, all right, they're paying. They don't have a lot of money. I got to make this work. Right. Michelle, I want to ask you, I saw something on Facebook this morning, literally, that had a photo of a prison, and it said, the United States spends more on prisons, and then the photo below, at the schoolroom, than it does on classrooms. Does some, is something wrong with that giant question mark to fill us with a sense of irony or whatever, rage or something? And, and I just thought to myself, like, this is, it's more the narrative that spending equals quality, inputs is what we need in education. Uh, talk about, I guess, the difference between public school funding and public school administration, because when we hear people say public school sucks, like Camille, there, there's a difference between public funding and public administration, right? Well, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the Friedman Foundation. They've done some amazing longitudinal studies on what they call school bloat or administrative bloat. If you look at the growth of the student population versus the amount of funding that goes into our public ed, and how much growth there has been in the administration, non-teaching staff, you'll see where the money goes. It's not to the children. So when you hear these outcries of, oh, it's for the children, or we need to fund our public schools, that's actually where the funding goes. So these you know, prison examples, I mean, if the money that we currently spend went to the kids, you know, actually did, and I don't think we need that kind of money in the first place to help them have an excellent education, but we would have a far more competitive public school environment. Right now, New Hampshire, I believe, spends close to $14,000 per child uh, for their K through 12. And of course, it's higher if you look at just the high school years than the uh, K through eight years. But I'm sorry, $14,000 a year for a very, very mediocre education. And what I always like people to, to do is do the math of an average size classroom. So 14,000, 10 kids, 140,000, 20 kids, 280,000, and 25 kids, you know, over $300,000 for every classroom. And so you have per to imagine, class. Right, what the teacher makes, subtract whatever they make, and you, what's, what's the rest being spent on is the question. So that's, that's the administrative bloat. 
So don't fall trapped to that. And when you look at your local taxes, at least in New Hampshire, a good portion of it, I think close to two, two thirds, three quarters of it, goes to your public school. Every taxpayer, whether you have children in the system or not, you're funding that. Hold them accountable. What are they spending that money on? Sure. So I want to ask uh, my uh, question about the last speaker. I don't know how many were here for the last speaker and heard, heard him talking. So, you know, I was in the audience, too, and he was kind of saying, oh, this, uh, you know, fiddling around the edges with these things like vouchers and charter schools is kind of a waste of our time. And it's uh, we need, you know, massive change like a free state project thing. And, you know, personally, having watched uh, innovations like charter schools and vouchers save lives of kids and had people weep in front of me talking about this to me, I, I bristled a little at that because I think some of these innovations, innovations are very important. And you're in a charter school now. So, so I mean, it's, it's a public school by definition, right? So I don't know, what do, you, what do you think about this idea that if we don't have you know, complete libertarian utopia, we, we're wasting our time with all these other things? Well, I definitely think that a charter school is a really good start in moving to uh, private schools and homeschooling. It gives families more of a choice and it gives you more freedom to begin with. So it's definitely a step in the right direction. Um, I, that basically answers it. Okay, all right, step in the right direction. Yeah, I, I agree with that too, yes. Well, in fact, yes, I want to applaud that. But first of all, this is step in the right direction. I've seen it change lives, and, and as, as we heard, over two million kids already in charters. And in places like New Orleans, over 90% of the kids are in charter schools. It's created a complete paradigm shift uh, there. Uh, and, so, and so, Camille, let me ask you, do you distinguish public funding from public administration when, you know, I mean, right? There's a big difference. You can have public funding, but if there's competition, that's a very different scenario. Uh, yeah, but uh, I never saw if uh, this system works, you know? Uh, but we have uh, something uh, near in Poland because when a child go to homeschooling, the school pay to the parents scholarship from this 14,000 uh, per, per child. So we have some kind of combination that you said that your child is go to unschooling or, uh, ho sorry, homeschooling. Parents have th those money and h they send this uh, child to private school. <laughs> so we have uh, th this kind of co combination. Uh, I can let, share let me my another question. Actually, tack to another question quickly. So, so where did you go to school? You're I was in public school, but... In Poland. In Poland, but you know, okay. I, sp I spent there maybe 40% of time. So you know, you're, okay. Because I established my own business when I had 16 and it's grown very fast, etc. So I, I didn't time to, to, to go to school because <laughs> okay. it was... All right. Well, so but before that, uh, if, if a kid uh, acted out, misbehaved, what was the discipline like in schools there? Would they yes. suspend the kid? Would they kick him out of the classroom? Would they... We always him? praying for suspicion. To, to be suspended, yeah. We, 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 we pray for this, so... Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you pray for the kid to be suspended, but I'm asking, were they regularly suspended if they did, if they did make noise and act out? No, it's, it's, it's not... No, we, we don't have punishment for, for misbehave. You don't? All right, well, I'm surprised I, you I, I, I don't know why, Jeremy, because, get... you know, we... Uh, my, my, my friends drink wine uh, in the classroom, and, uh, you know, they... That they fight together, and I don't know. Public school, my public school, was really horrible. All right. Well, we can understand why you left. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, Jody, talk about discipline, because I do hear this is a huge problem where teachers are told to deal with it in the classroom, and the one, a couple disruptive kids ruin it for everyone. Wait, I don't understand the question. The question is, uh, it, uh, are because uh, we mentioned culture, and the idea is uh, in a lot of regular public schools. Um, kids kind of go crazy. They they are uh, they misbehave. They're loud. They don't participate. Oftentimes, when they pick a school or their parents pick a school, whether a charter or a private school, they have a sense that I'm in some place special. There's there's no guarantee I get to be here, and so I'm going to behave better. And so it also the, the opposite side of that is in public school. There's a sensibility on a part of a lot of kids that 
hey, you, you know, I deserve to be here, yeah. and what are you going to do to me? And, you know, tough, that kind of thing. Right. I mean, I mean you certainly get that. Um, and, and why wouldn't you? I mean, it's exactly what you would expect, you know, from an economics perspective. Um, and not all kids are like that, right? I mean, some kids get it. Some kids are like, yeah, this is a waste of time, and they do what Camille did. Um, I mean, but, you know, the, the direction that schools are heading is if, if you misbehave, they, they'll try to tag you with some special ed category, and then you have an individual person following you around. And you, it, it's like nobody's paying attention to the rest of the kids in the class. If you have a disruptive kid, a kid who can't sit still or whatever, the rest of the class gets affected by it. And so then we spend more money to tie him down in his chair, which is the worst for him. And I, Do you find over-diagnosis uh, of special needs? Do you think that to get more money, schools are incented to call kids special needs who really aren't? Uh, of course, nobody would admit to that, but yeah, sure, I've seen it. I'm in the 90s, there was a huge surge. They say they've, they've tamped down on that a bit. But I don't see it. I, I see a lot more going on. Yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah, right. I, I mean, I, yeah. I, and, what, and I was just going to say, in places like Oregon, they, had, they passed a rule to say, all right, we're going to set a maximum. 13% is the most any district <laughs> can say that special, there's special need population. And in two seconds, every district had exactly 13% 13 special needs population. Yeah to get the money that awesome. that would, from which that would accrue. But, Go ahead. But even with that, I'm sorry. Yeah. But even with that, so you have kids who can't get that learning disabled category, they'll still go to the event, if they're not performing well in school, they'll give them drugs because they don't know what to do with them. So that's sure. like the default behavior as well. Let's sure. calm them down, and, you get drugs. And, and dare I say, it's also a gender issue too where there's kind of a war on boys, it's been right. written about in schools, where boys naturally uh, act out more and are more rambunctious and that's considered basically it's been written very recently, some reports that kind of boys are being taught to act more like girls and in, in many schools, but go ahead, Mike. Um, when I was in public school for the two months that I was there, um, more than half of the class had constant visits at the nurse's office. There was one boy that I remember in particular who spent more time at the nurse's office than he did in our classroom. And we had, this is a public school in Manchester, New Hampshire, and we had uh, autistic kids coming in and out of the class all the time, and they had their uh, nurses with them who would teach them special things, even though they were sitting with the rest of the class. And it was really messy, because people were constantly coming and going, and it was all to the nurse. Uh, one of the things that, in, uh, probably the thing that makes me the most angry when I think about New Hampshire education uh, school choice is how you guys passed a law, Michelle, and it was passed, and it was a law for school choice, and that means money could be given, uh, tax credit uh, donations could be given to scholarship organizations that could donate it to kids to go to either... Uh, uh, Any uh, school they want. Private schools, yeah. secular or religious, and a judge came along and said, all right, well, if a parent on their own decides to pick a religious school with this private with this money, we've decided that's a violation of the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment. That's the government establishing a church, apparently, if a parent on their own decides to put a kid in a Catholic school, a Jewish school, a Protestant school, et cetera. Right, Michelle? Right. So within days of starting uh, the New Hampshire Tax Credit Scholarship Program run by the Network for Educational Opportunity, there was a lawsuit filed. Prime litigant was Bill Duncan. He sits on the State Board of Education. You talk about a hostile environment to operate in. Uh, so we, we did battle with that with the help of the Institute for Justice, awesome guys. They helped us and we were able, well, we lost the first round. So in Superior Court, we, they filed it deliberately in a district that would be more sympathetic to their cause. So we lost round one but we battled it out continually and we won at the New Hampshire Supreme Court level, which then allowed us to use these scholarships when a parent chose a religious school. So this year has been our first full year of being able to operate and fundraise and let children go to those schools if that's what they selected. So the scholarship program is the only one in the program that also gives the scholarship to homeschooled kids. It's the only one that has that provision. So it's, it's really a way of empowering parents with a lot more choice than they would otherwise be able to have. To I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. If, well, if a parent right now in this room lives in New Hampshire, maybe they homeschool, maybe they send the kid to a private school, and they would like to get one of these grants, what do they do? 
uh, network for educational opportunity. Our, unfortunately, our scholarship application window just finished on the 15th. We have to operate within very narrow parameters. Uh, but homeschool families and any family, it's uh, a needs-based uh, application process. So the people that need the most help are the ones that qualify for the most. Uh, but it's, it's, it's a great program. We accept donations year round, but uh, it, and individuals and businesses can qualify. So businesses get uh, roughly 85% of every dollar back as a tax credit. So it, I mean, frankly, why feed the beast if you can help kids? So it, it's a great win-win. Businesses benefit, the families benefit, the kids get a program, a educational setting that fits their needs and goals. And your contributions uh, have a cap, but you're still way, you haven't raised anywhere oh. near what the cap is. So you we, actually would love to get more donations. And like yes. you said, it's almost a, a, a one for one dollar for dollar, 85 cent return. It, they pay that much less in taxes for every dollar they give you. Exactly. They pay 85 cents less in taxes. Exactly. Right. And it, it makes a difference in these kids' okay. lives. It, it, We've got a video that shows the, how it's impacted these families. I mean, it's a tearjerker. <laughs> and you it's accept great. small donations. Absolutely. So someone here might want to donate any Please. amount to your organization. Jody, you wanted to talk more about that. Wait, I mean, it, it's sort of, there's just a tangent here based on this. It, it has to do with um, religious schooling. So I'm involved in professional education organizations, and um, there's this one instructional design um, conference that I, I went to where they were talking about homeschooling and how, now, now, keep in mind, these are a bunch of professors at these things. They sit on these national committees that define the Common Core, that decide at a national level what to do next. And the conversation, again, was about homeschooling, and somebody raised an objection that there was a family who was using a, um, uh, an online uh, s charter school kind of thing, but through, for homeschooling, and they were teaching their kids religious subjects in the context of this online charter school, and they were like, we don't want that. We don't want them there. They shouldn't be doing that. And I'm like, wait, you were talking about a parent, right? And they're like, yeah, but it doesn't matter. They're using our resources. They get to decide what happens for the individual. And um, I was, I, I, I didn't, I had no words. I just didn't even know how to address that. Statism personified. <laughs> Deciding for someone else what's best for them. Because exactly. I'm such a genius, I will run your life for you. Right. Right, exactly. Uh, we actually haven't, had any questions actually, we probably should have left more time for Q&A. Anyone have any questions about the stuff we talked about? And uh, while we wait that, I want to talk, uh, ask, ask you guys also, if anyone wants to talk about massive online open courses or MOOCs, free courses offered by MIT, Harvard, Stanford, University of Chicago, uh, great universities all around, around the world, actually, participating in online learning. You guys have any thoughts on how that might change the paradigm? You know, the, the only thing I can say about that is in my professional communities, there, there's, we, people believe this is just a bubble. They expect it to burst. The college, that, college that tuition? That MOOCs will go away. Oh, MOOCs will go away. Yes, I find that very interesting. Maybe they don't like that equity, I don't know. But that's the word I hear. Right. Well, Khan Academy also is free. It also offers education through YouTube. We have Khan Academy fan here. Uh, perhaps you, 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 should, you should watch my interview with Sal Khan on Choice Media. Uh, go ahead, you want to talk? Yeah, but, but remember, this is only knowledge. You know, you, you, you sit in your home, you, you watch this lecture, speakers, you, you know something, but you don't know anyone. So the, it's, it is half of the way. No. You, you must, I don't know why they don't organize, you know, many meetings, etc. Even without lecture, but we can, you know, uh, meet at the Rogers campground and change idea. Because, come on, so some of you, you know, uh, and your school graduate maybe 10 years ago. What do you remember from school? Yeah, you remember your friends. Because this friend have this company, this friend working for government, this friend, uh, and you, when you want, you know, organize something, yeah, I can call to him because it's, it's much easier. Yeah? Yeah, no. So less knowledge, yeah. more uh, and, and, human and being. Yeah? I think you make a good point that knowledge is now here. So yeah. we all have all the knowledge we need. It's now more about thinking. Go ahead, sir. So uh, the NEO scholarship seemed to have far greater demand than supply. And so I was wondering if there's a, a legislative fix for that. Um, right now, businesses can get the 85% tax credit. As I understand it, individuals can get a federal income tax deduction, but it's not at, 
quite the incentive, so maybe we could do something to incentivize individuals to give more, uh, some sort of tax credit for um, maybe individuals uh, payment of the, the statewide portion of the property tax or something like that. Uh, is, are there any plans to uh, expand the law so that we get uh, a much bigger scholarship program? Um, to date, so far there isn't. We've been actually not only dealing with the lawsuit, but we've had to fight off two repeal efforts in the legislature. So truly, it, we've been more on defense. Uh, that's what I'm here for. I, play, I fight them at the legislative level while Kate Baker's been concentrating on fundraising and trying to provide those lifeboats for kids to, who are looking for those ways out of the public school system and into a, a better choice. But I mean, there's certainly ways that we could do that, but when you start messing with federal tax deduction, I don't know if that, that really complicates the game a lot on a legislative level. And also, I think that not with this governor is what I'm hearing about New Hampshire. If you're going yeah, to improve she's, the program, wait till the next governor comes along. Is yeah, what she's I'm hearing. not exactly in favor of parental rights and choice issues okay. at all. Okay, ma'am, go ahead. Hey, um, I've been attending a lot of the education panels and listening to a lot of the conversation about this. It's very interesting. I'm very passionate about it. Um, one of the things that I'm curious about, though, is that there are children that have specialized needs. There's children with autism. There's children with Down syndrome. There's children that do require more than the average student. So I'm hearing a lot about um, a whole lot of like, um, for a lack of better term, normal children operate in the classroom and how their life is disrupted by these children. I'm just curious as to what would be proposed to help those children that do have specialized needs. Go ahead, yeah. sure. So, I mean, if it were a needs basis about educational issues, I. I think I'd be happier with that. But they've expanded into health issues beyond belief. And the government dictates, all state government in this case, dictates what everything costs. So we have a special ed kid in Croydon who is placed in another district because he's not performing well in the local school. And this is because he's, basically this kid, as I understand it, he, um, he hit a teacher. I mean, he's just sort of out of control and they had to take him out of the classroom. So it's, I mean, ridiculous. I mean, my, my town is hurting from this. We're a small town, town population 750. Every expense hurts everybody in our town. So, but the transportation alone is something like $16,000 a year. Like, are you kidding me? Why is it, and the government dictates these costs, right? So, so you can think about the kids, but how about the people on, on fixed incomes who are supporting it? You got I mean, if you're going to think about everybody, think about everybody. So again, if it were just about education and helping kids to learn, let, let's figure it out. I don't know, but the way it's doing it now, it's not the right way. There are also uh, charter schools that specialize in pro private schools specializing in special needs kids, that, and those are growing around the country. There, are, I don't think anyone in our movement basically. So oftentimes, people specialize in something they get better at it, right? Like teaching a certain kind of student who has, and there are all kinds of different needs. You know, there's deaf, there are deaf kids and blind kids, and and and. and the list goes on. So, uh, um, uh, did you have a follow-up? Yes, I do. I just have a follow-up. I recognize that it is very costly to provide a lot of things for those specialized students. I work um, in foster care, and oh, get to the mic. There we go. I'm a little short, so here we go. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, who set all that right. mic up for her? It's all, it's <laughs> definitely it's, it's too like high. It's like way taller than me. Oh. But um, <laughs> I think that there is. If, yeah. if schools develop plans, like you said, the private schools are developing plans for specialized education for these students, you could do it in a creative, cost-effective way by eliminating the, the government's uh, mandates. Yeah. And especially when those mandates are unfunded and fall on the burden of the taxpayers. Right. And those are grandfathered in. Because we, we, we have a, we're not supposed to get unfunded mandates unless it was something that happened before. And so the um, 1972, I guess, anything after that is we don't get it but anything before. So the civil rights stuff from before. That's not the right word. Um, for special ed kids, what's the? ADA. What? Was it the ADA? Yeah, the ADA. Yes. So that was passed before. So, so unfunded mandates, perfectly fine, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right, well, I, I guess we're out of time. We have plenty more. Any other quick final thoughts before we, before we go and, and they run us off? Go ahead. I don't have Todd, but I have a question. You really in America give uh, you know drugs to children who behave? Yes. 
and you still call the, those person human? I didn't hear the question, but what he asked, he's like, you really give drugs to kids that aren't behaving in school? Absolutely. Are you kidding? That's big, 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 big business. Yeah. yeah. Um, anyway, so uh, and I and and just just to clarify, Maya, the lice thing, you're good with that. It's all uh, no more. It's all gone. <laughs> all right, good. You can get me near me. <laughs> Please thank our panel for being a part of the education discussion today, and we'll see you around.